I am taking a pause on new content for a few days while I get a few other things done. But given that the latest IPCC report did not make any groundbreaking shifts on the idea of climate tipping points, I thought you might be interested to see again my video on the topic of tipping points from last year. When the more apocalyptic climate campaigners such as Extinction Rebellion, who have been protesting again in London over last week, when they focus heavily on non-linear possible events of their narrative, it's worth being clear what the research does and doesn't say on this topic. See what you think. I'll be back with the usual Friday News Roundup video in a couple of days. If you've looked at the amount of global warming we actually see year on year, it seems very gradual, at least on our human scale timeline. And then if you listen to the rhetoric of the likes of Extinction Rebellion and some of the more apocalyptic scientific voices, you might wonder at the gulf between the gradual incrementalism of the former and the immediate and huge consequences promised by the latter. Predominantly, the difference is explained by the existence of so-called tipping points. The argument that the gradual changes will trigger faster and more profound transformation because suddenly we'll hit a point of no return. And before you know it, there'll be a flood of methane or a massive increase in melting ice or sea level rise or whatever. You can divide the potential tipping points that have been identified into three based on the temperature needed to trip them. First, the early tipping points, which could be triggered between one to three degrees centigrade above pre-industrial temperatures. Obviously, these are a big point of focus since we're already at approximately 1.2 degrees C. They are coral reefs, the West Antarctic ice sheet, the Greenland ice sheet, the Arctic summer sea ice and alpine glaciers. Then there are the mid tipping points which could be kicked off at 3 to 5 degrees centigrade. These are the jet stream, boreal forest, the El Nino southern oscillation, thermohaline circulation, the Amazon rainforest, the Indian summer monsoon and the Sahel. And then finally, the later tipping points, thought to be a thing above 5 degrees centigrade. The Arctic winter sea ice, the permafrost and the East Antarctic ice sheet. Some of these would be more challenging than others. For instance, if the coral reefs die, that will be a tragedy, a loss of rich and astonishing biodiversity. But that will be that. If the permafrost melts, then that may release a lot of methane and that would be expected to create an additional positive feedback leading to additional warming. And when some of the campaigners warn about runaway climate change, they're generally referring to those sorts of tipping points. Bear in mind, these are not all the positive feedbacks we might expect. For instance, as the oceans warm, they can hold less CO2, so that would potentially lead to more CO2 being gassed into the atmosphere. But the tipping points are meant to be the ones that, once they've been triggered, varies then effectively, on human timescales anyway, a permanent change. Once the coral reefs have all died, there's no going back. Once the alpine glaciers have melted, they just won't reappear. To give you some sense of how dramatic the tipping point language has become, here's a clip of Greta Thunberg talking last year to the UK Houses of Parliament. Year 2030, 10 years. 252 days and 10, 10 hours away from now, we will be in a position where we set off an irreversible chain reaction beyond the human control that will most likely lead to the end of our civilization as we know it. Furthermore, these calculations do not include unforeseen tipping points and feedback loops, like the extremely powerful methane gas escaping from rapidly thawing Arctic permafrost. And no, it's not just teenagers. No lesser a personage than the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, said this in 2018. If we do not change course by 2020, we risk missing the point where we can avoid runaway climate change with disastrous consequences for people and all the natural systems that sustain us. Both those sources have been extensively quoted by the campaigners, and you can understand why. 
every marketer knows that creating an air of immediacy and urgency helps with any sales process. One of the problems with getting people to take climate change seriously has always been that for a lot of people it seemed like a problem that might affect their grandchildren. It felt a very long way away. And we human beings tend to discount the importance of problems that are a long way away. Because even if we think they're serious, they're never as serious and as urgent as the most immediate problems of today. So something that suggests that we're on the clock is an attempt to challenge that tendency. Which is why we have so many deadlines being thrown around. 12 years to save the planet, 2 years to stop runaway climate change, and so on and so on. But of course, it's not just about time urgency. It's also about severity, catastrophe. The IPCC reports, and this is why campaigners put it about how conservative they are, give evidence that's broadly in line with a gradual incremental process. The language of tipping points disrupts that gradualism with a promise that we could dramatically and suddenly lurch into terrible consequences felt in the short term, or at the very least stumble past a point of no return to catastrophe in the medium term. It's the entire premise that enables Extinction Rebellion to say things like this to young children. You are in a terrible predicament. It's worse than you've been told, almost certainly, probably a lot worse. Dangerous climate change and the extinction crisis, the crisis of many, many species going extinct as we speak, if they're not stopped, will mean that you do not have normal lives like your parents have. This is about whether you have a future. The interesting thing is that the more I looked into the science underpinning the tipping points language of the campaigners, the less actual scientific support it turned out to have. For instance, many of these tipping points have long time scales. Take as an example the Greenland ice sheet. Maybe the climate system will reach the point where the Greenland ice sheet has melted in a way that won't be reversed, short of a geological time scale anyway. Even if we'd already hit the temperature at which that would happen, which isn't thought to be likely, but is possible, it would still take several centuries to occur, which is not rapid, not life-threatening to the children of today, and is actually reversible for quite some time into the future. Does that mean there's no issue and no discussion? No, but it's hard to get into the nuance of that discussion because, as always, the science is being drowned out by people who see a campaign incentive to talk up the immediate threat, arguing with the other people on the other side who are discounting and disregarding any potential threat. We need to separate what the evidence is telling us from the people who have a strong preference for what they wish the evidence would tell us. As you would expect, a number of scientists have examined the issue of tipping points in climate change. It's a relatively recent arrival in the discourse of climate science. Chris Russell did a review of how this entered into the scientific discourse in a paper published in 2015. Just 10 years previous to that, in 2005, there was only one article that had been published on tipping points. Lindsay and Zhang claimed to have identified a tipping point for Arctic summer sea ice. But in spite of its absence from the scientific literature, it was already appearing in the public discourse. Specifically, John Schellnuber was quoted by the BBC and The Guardian warning of potential tipping points in the Earth system, and he produced a tipping points map. John Schellnuber is the founder of the Potsdam Institute, the institutional home for Johann Rockström, another key advocate. You may recall that Rockström was a person whose opinion is the main one that was quoted in support of Extinction Rebellion's Roger Hallam his contention that six billion people would die in the next few decades, although that exact number appears to have been generated by a mistake by The Guardian, which quoted Rockstrom as saying Earth wouldn't support a billion people, where he actually said eight billion people. Nevertheless, a key figure in the catastrophist narrative and the Potsdam Institute very much the centre of tipping point advocacy. In December 2005, James Hansen put the term into wider use with his widely reported warning of the American Geophysical Union. We are on the precipice of climate system tipping points 
beyond which there is no redemption. Chris Russell said, Hansen's use of tipping point was metaphorical, like his references to time bomb, slippery slope or Achilles heel. It also had an ongoing catastrophe as its immediate context. The disasters precipitated by Hurricane Katrina were widely perceived as a failure of the US government to heed warnings of impeding danger from government scientists. As well, FEMA official Michael Brown described the catastrophe as the result of crossed tipping points. Now that was of course well beyond what the science could support at the time. In fact, it was the inability for science to make any definitive statements about Hurricane Katrina that rather kick-started attempts to develop a better methodology for attribution science, such as I discussed in my recent video about the rainstorms in the UK. Professor Miles Allen from the University of Oxford summarised how difficult it is, even now, to look back on Katrina and come up with an answer. While research at the time of Katrina pointed to sea surface temperatures and sea level as causing damage and having a human contribution, other researchers suggested warming sea surface temperatures elsewhere and changing atmospheric vertical structure may have had a countervailing effect, making the overall impact of human activity on Katrina unclear. The thing is that by 2006, tipping points had become a climate change discussion trend. Even though, still at that point, there was still very little published science about it. Doesn't prove anything about the science, it's just a testament to the power of the idea to tap into the popular imagination. And it quickly led to the shift in arguments where the proponents of a tipping point emphasised a risk management approach to climate policy. Key messages were that possibility, not likelihood, should feature more prominently in planning and that abrupt changes wouldn't be manageable in the way that gradual change would be. In 2007, Tim Lenton joined John Shelnuber in calling for tipping points to come to the front of the policy agenda, with that focus on risk management centre stage. Early narratives on tipping points focused on a proposed shutdown of the North Atlantic Thermohaline Circulation, or THC. It was suggested that this was the likely area with the earliest important tipping point. The THC, visualised as an oceanic conveyor belt, would flip from one state to another and this would then have a rapid knock-on effect in other areas. It was labelled by one researcher as the Achilles heel of the climate system. However, the research failed to back this up and relatively quickly over time, the fears of a THC tipping point receded into the distance, and the focus shifted instead onto Arctic sea ice. This fear principally applies to the potential loss of summer sea ice, which had been predicted for some years, and which would reduce the amount of albedo, reflectivity of the sun's radiation from the ice, and consequently the greater absorption of heat by the darker water that would be exposed by the melted ice. This may well be on the cards, although so far there have been various predictions that have failed to emerge, and it isn't straightforward to separate the hyperbole from the actual science. Nevertheless, it's not unreasonable to think this would be the most likely threshold to be crossed in the short term. It is, however, the tipping point that could most easily be reversed, since summer sea ice melt is a seasonal event for clues in the name. In 2007, the IPCC gave no hint of sea ice tipping points in its AR4 report, and sentiment began to move away from it. Journalist Richard Kerr, covering climate change of the journal Science, reporting on developments in Arctic sea ice modelling, summarised that there are no tipping points. Mark Cerise, a Arctic sea ice specialist who was formerly an advocate for sea ice tipping points, changed his view in 2011, saying this... The tipping point argument can perhaps be laid to rest. He still believed that the Arctic summer sea ice would disappear and this would be a serious concern, but it didn't have a tipping point. And that was a position of the IPCC's AR5 report as well. The authors noted that although there had been a small number of studies suggesting evidence for global tipping points using simplified climate models, there was no evidence of global scale tipping points in any of the more comprehensive models. 
They did say this, there is evidence for threshold behaviour in certain aspects of the climate system, such as ocean circulation and ice sheets on multi-centennial to millennial timescales. There are also arguments for the existence of regional tipping points, most notably in the Arctic, although aspects of this are contested. One of the papers that's fueled the focus on tipping points in recent years was this one, Trajectories of the Earth System in the Anthropocene, by Will Steffen and a number of other authors, including aforementioned Johan Rockström. The paper says this, We explore the risk that self-reinforcing feedbacks could push the Earth system toward a planetary threshold that, if crossed, could prevent stabilisation of the climate at intermediate temperature rises and cause continued warming on a hothouse Earth pathway, even as human emissions are reduced. It goes on to explain where it thinks such a threshold might lie. We suggest 2 degrees centigrade because of the risk that a 2 degrees centigrade warming could activate important tipping elements, raising the temperature further to activate other tipping elements in a domino-like cascade that could take the Earth system to even higher temperatures. It gives an example of such a cascade. For example, tipping of the Greenland ice sheet could trigger a critical transition in the Atlantic meridional ocean circulation, AMOC, which could together, by causing sea level rise and southern ocean heat accumulation, accelerate ice loss from the East Antarctic ice sheets on time scales of centuries. This was the article, therefore, that led Johann Rockström to give one of the most repeated quotes. We are the ones in control right now. But once we go past two degrees, we see that the Earth system tips over from being a friend to a foe. We totally hand over our fate to an Earth system that starts rolling out of equilibrium. A number of scientists were asked to comment on the paper. Professor Martin Seigert, co-director of the Grantham Institute Imperial College London, said this. Threshold and tipping points have been discussed previously, but to state that 2 degrees centigrade is a threshold we can't pull back from is new, I think. I'm not sure what evidence there is for this, or indeed whether there can be until we experience it. It's just a suggestion in any case. The paper is essentially an essay or review of others' work, rather than original research, but they've collated previously published ideas and theories to present a narrative on how the threshold change would work. It's rather selective, but not outlandish. Not everyone agreed with that last part. James Annan referred to the paper as nonsense and said this. The paper lists a number of possible positive carbon cycle feedbacks and quantifies them as summing to a little under half a degree of additional warming. The authors then wave their hands and say it could all get much worse. And with one bound, Jack was free, end of paper. I went through it again to see what I'd missed, and I really hadn't. It is just make-believe. They don't explore the risk at all. They just assert it is significant. And Miles Allen also commented on this last year. So please stop saying something globally bad is going to happen in 2030. Bad stuff is already happening, and every half a degree of warming matters. But the IPCC does not draw a planetary boundary at 1.5 degrees C beyond which lie climate dragons. None of this has dented the enthusiasm for tipping points in the public discourse. Neither does it prove that they definitely don't exist. As ever, we should be respectful of what we don't know. But it's questionable whether that alone justifies the tenor of the discussion. And it definitely doesn't justify this. People probably sometimes ask you, what are you going to be when you grow up? But we've reached a point in human history where the question also has to be asked, what are you going to do if you grow up? The incorporation of language at tipping points into the vocabulary of the campaigners is about conveying an air of urgency to the public and a cloak for predictions of catastrophe that go well beyond what actual observed trends suggest. The question then becomes whether it's a genuinely helpful tool in communication as the campaigners believe it to be. And arguably, it both is and it isn't. It's certainly been a motivator for some. After all, for all their talk about the previous generation having failed them, you've got to think it's pretty unlikely that the school strikes would have happened if those children hadn't been made to believe that it was their generation 
that was imminently to bear the consequences of climate change. But that only takes you so far, because getting a few more people out on the street shouldn't be mistaken for real change. Rather than being a motivator for wider change, the unintended consequence observed from the real world seems to be that it's actually extremely polarising, which actually creates a barrier to progress. And that's particularly the case because of high-profile campaigners that are seeking to use the cause in a manipulative way, such as Extinction Rebellion calling for the overthrow of parliamentary authority via a citizens' assembly, or the US Democratic left, led by Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, calling for a Green New Deal that just happens to incorporate a political wish list of unrelated left-wing proposals. These political packages are guaranteed to polarise by their very nature. And it also sets you up for a huge fall. For instance, in 2008, a campaign website was set up to tell us that we had 100 months to save the planet. The website's still up at 100months.org. Unsurprisingly, it's no longer updated and all dates have been taken off. The same will happen with the 12 years to save the planet and all of these artificial deadlines. So look, having looked at all this, this is where I'm left for now. I find it persuasive that there is no reason to believe that there is a particular tipping point or threshold between a low harm future and a catastrophic collapse of civilization. That's just a reflection of where the evidence seems to be. Nothing is final. Some people say the science is settled. Here's an excellent example where that's demonstrably not the case. There needs to be more research into this complex system to build a greater degree of confidence in understanding of how that system responds to change. But right now, an honest description of where we are really seems to align with what the IPCC actually says. But every year we delay taking action commits us to ever larger changes in the future, which will certainly have negative impacts, which almost certainly outweigh the positive ones. That should be enough. And here's the thing. If you say you're campaigning for the truth, then you yourself should be ready to confront and come to terms with the truth. And if you say you're being led to the science, great. Look to the science. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please share with anyone else you think would also enjoy it. Word of mouth is really important to us. And if you've not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? As the saying goes, that subscribe button won't smash itself.